All right, well, good evening, Ephesians chapter 4. Let's continue about answering God's call, Ephesians chapter 4. And we started off, we talked about the last couple weeks, about the foundation, about we understand that the calling of God is to be able to build the body of Christ. It's also to use our lives to minister to other people and to evangelize. And so Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and following says this. Ephesians 4, verse 11 through 16 says this, And he gave some apostles and some prophets. Now, that was Old Testament. Apostles, they passed off. The last apostle was Paul. And then some prophets. And so those are the ones that were called of God to go and, and proclaim what God's special message. And some evangelists. We have evangelists today. We have one that comes every year, Brother Marvin, those people, and those people that travel. That is their calling of God, is to preach evangelistic meetings, uh, to, to pray for revival, work for revival. And that's where Mrs. Fryer learned, with her father being an evangelist, her style of piano playing was called evangelistic. You've heard her brother play, which is a total different, and that's classical which also designates their personalities. Her brother was more of the classical style, and Mrs. Fryer was more of the get up and go and let's get busy type um, um, personality. And some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the maturing of the saints, for the work of the ministry. The purpose of this, these evangelists and pastors and teachers is also for the work of the ministry to present different things for the people of God to get involved, like these Christmas shoeboxes, and for the edifying of the building of the body of Christ. How long do they do that? How long do we do this? Till we all come in the unity of the faith. Boy, I mean, it would have to take a God to bring everyone together under one tent to agree on the same thing, wouldn't it? I mean, you can't get families sometimes to agree about certain things. Can you imagine this huge global body of Christ where finally all the different things that have caused strife and division and problems and angers and things like that, it'll all be taken care of. It says, so we all come in the unity of faith uh, and the knowledge and of the knowledge of the Son of God. We will truly know who Christ is unto the perfect man or the mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's when all of our imperfections will be gone. All of our hurts, habits, and hang-ups will be removed. We will be, the, we will be just like Christ. And it says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So it says that till we henceforth be no more children, that we grow up. Have you ever seen two people argue about the most unnecessary things? It's just like going to a playground at, a, at an elementary school. That's mine. No, that's mine. What color is it? Doesn't matter. It's not yours. It's mine. And it's just, so we grow up. And it says, toss to and fro with, about with every wind of doctrine. Boy, there's all kinds of things that are coming out when it comes when it comes to the Bible and the church and different doctrines. There's all kinds of them. Finally, when Christ comes, all this deception, all this deceit, all these rabbit rabbit trails and hobby horses that different preachers and churches have, it's all going to be done. Amen. We're going to all be grown adults under the auspices of the name of Jesus Christ. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him. That's part of the, the process is that speaking to people in love to allow us to grow up. If we're going to grow up, we got to find out what we need to correct our, in our lives, don't we? That's part of growing up. It says, in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, making increase the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Basically saying that we're all working together 
and we're all doing what we're supposed to do, and we're all acting like we're supposed to act, and we'll be like a well-oiled machine. That's basically what that is. is. If you want to boil it all down in our terms today, it's just that everything is working great. And so it says, make it increase the body unto the edifying of itself. How do we do it? In love. Now, as believers, we have the ability to love because we have God in our lives, because God is love. But the world has no clue what love is all about. We do because we have the example for God so loved the world that he gave. But the world doesn't look at it that way. It's about personal gratification. It's about just taking self instead of other people. Others, Lord, this others, that this my motto be, let me live for others that I can be more like thee. And so when we're looking at the body and we're talking about serving the Lord and we're talking about our calling, it's not about us, it's all about Christ. It's all about building the body of Christ. It's about encouraging our brothers and sisters of Christ all over the world. And when you think about what's happening, and I trust you've been praying for Israel, what, I mean, there, I mean, if, if you listen to all these different prophecy people, man, they're, I mean, they're just shooting off these different things, and I mean, they've got Jesus coming before he's even come yet. So you got to be careful with that. But as you just observe and as you listen, I mean, when you're talking about, they're talking about Israel and we're talking about um, the Gaza Strip and we're talking about Iran and we're talking about Hamas and we're talking about all these different other groups and they're threatening and you got our air, two aircraft carrier uh, groups over there. And then, then they're talking about, oh, by the way, you've got Russia, Ukraine and China and Taiwan and what's going to happen? The, the Bible says, Jesus said, that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. Is that not what's happening today? And you're going to have people against each other. Uh, you are literally seeing the dissolving of our country. I heard that today that people got into the Capitol building and protested against Israel in our Capitol building. And all the different stuff that's happening around our country, around our world, you got to say, man, this is all total confusion. Jesus said, when all these things start to happen, lift up your eyes, your redemption draweth nigh. Now, do we know when our redemption draws nigh? No. But he says, be prepared. That's the purpose of looking up, of understanding that no matter what's happening and all the different voices and all the different activities that's happening around the world, is that, don't be so caught up in all the voices of the world that you forget to listen to that still small voice coming from the Lord. That's our calling, is not to give up, not to say, well, Jesus is coming, I guess my job is over. He hasn't come yet, so our job's not over yet. Is it scary what could happen? Yes. What they're prognosticating? You know, they don't know what's going to happen. But they'll throw things out and people take it. I mean, they'll take it and run with it like a, like a hook with the fish. They'll take that thing off. And then after it's, oops, we probably were just a little bit uh, preemptive in what we had to say. Duh, you figured this out? So you got to tamp down the emotions and yet look at it through the realization, are we praying for those people that are hurting? Are we praying for those mission fields and missionaries in those areas? A man, the only other man that's in the church that is serving God full time for the church that I got saved in, that's no longer there. He is the head of International Baptist Jewish Missions. And he is in Israel and distributing things to the Israel churches and ministry and people there. And so one of the things his daughter said, please pray for dad because he's right in the middle of all that stuff. You think about what's happening over in the in the uh, in Europe. Just because you've got stuff in Russia and Ukraine doesn't doesn't mean it's not affecting the rest of Europe. And don't forget that you have. And I told you about one of my missionary friends that's in the United Kingdom. It's where literally the United Kingdom, which is being overrun 
with, with Muslims, and now they said that they will start having open prayer time like they do in the Middle East, in the United Kingdom, and yet they're, they're shutting down churches and telling pastors, you better get someone to sponsor you and make it approved by the government, otherwise you're going to be kicked out of our country. Then you think of what's happening over in the uh, Far East, not just in, in China, but what they call um, the Pacific Rim. What's happening over there? There's missionaries over in India, and all, I mean, those different religions, they're literally going through and burning churches down. And they're protesting, and they're, I mean, it's just, it's like, everything's just gone completely nuts. But Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, it's going to be in those last days. And so when you see all the stuff that's happening, that's what's happening. And that's why God looked at all that stuff and said, you know what, I'm done. I'm done with you people. We've done, I've done everything I could for you, and that's the way you treat each other, and that's the way you treat me. I'm going to destroy the world. Do you know that, and we'll get into this in a little bit, do you know that when Noah was told to build the ark, he was never told how long he would be in there until he got into the boat? Just think about that. He was told the dimensions of the boat, but he was never told how long it was until he got into the boat. Something to think about. He doesn't want us to worry about all the, the, the future. He's worried about right now. Do what you're supposed to do right now and let, the, let everything work out. It took him over 100 years to build that boat. He didn't have a build a boat from uh, Lowe's or something like that. Didn't have any of that stuff. They just did what they're supposed to do every day. And so, but that was their calling. Our calling is to keep doing the same things we're supposed to do every day of our lives. Get up. Have our time with the Lord. Do what we're supposed to do. Pray, minister, work, all those different things. Do what you're supposed to, and then put your head on your pillow that night and ask God to forgive you for what you didn't do, or, or, and then... Thank you, God, for another day, Lord. If you give me tomorrow, I'll do my best tomorrow. That's part of the calling of God upon our lives. It's not some mystical, spooky thing. I've told you many times that every time we have a missionary here, I want to go. Lord, I'm ready. No, you're not going. But why, Lord? Because you're not done with this job yet. But God, I want to go. Well, you do it another way. You're not leaving here. Okay. That's the call. The call is to serve. The call is desire to say, Lord, what else can I do with my life? The call is, Lord, I will do what I can to the best of my abilities. And I'm not going to get frustrated because things I don't get accomplished or the things I can't get accomplished. I'm going to rejoice the fact what I can get done. And that's how you've got to look at it. That he has these, these evangelists and pastors and teachers for the purpose of building the, the body up because the body sometimes we destroy our own selves. One of our one of my best friends who's an uh, evangelist, um, lost both his legs in Vietnam, said, We're the only Christian army that kills its own wounded. Other military, Amer American military, no person left behind. Christian army, lay down there and suffer. You're not good enough. You probably, didn't, you probably weren't spiritual enough and God didn't answer your prayers or you have some sin in your life, so you're not good enough to serve again. And yet we have a ministry of reconciliation. And reconciliation is to bring the, the hurting it back into the fold. In whatever way, or, I mean, they're out there. There are people that used to go to churches who said, I'm not going to go back to church because of that. Because my, I'll always, if they let me, if I get into the conversation, they let me, well, have you ever had bad instances here? Most of us at Walmart. Well, yeah. I said, did you keep coming back? Well, yeah. 
That's a dumb, dumb question. No, it's not, because you said you had a bad instance in church, but didn't come back, but you came here and had a bad... I need this. Well, don't you need church? Don't you need the Lord's and God's people in fellowship? They don't like it. They get mad. No, I don't need those people. They're a bunch of hypocrites. Okay. Uh, let's go around the corner and look at those people out there in Walmart. I think they might be some hypocrites out there too. So, I, so whatever people use, and but that that is their coping mechanism with the hope of a, if I just get nasty enough, they'll back away. I don't want I don't want you touching that area. The ministry of reconciliation is being able to get the Lord, the balm of Gilead, as it says in the Old Testament, which is a picture of the Lord who heals and reconciles, get them back in the position to realize they can serve the Lord again. And people have all kinds of thoughts, strange thoughts. About three weeks ago, I told you about the family that quit coming because we had the the, the combined Spanish and English thing, and God, God don't want Spanish people being with with, with uh, English people. And so I saw I saw the the wife at Walmart, and um, I said hi to her. We walked in. She, I don't know if she's not listening to me or ignoring me. I said, okay, I'm not done with her. I think this is a God appointment here. <laughs> so. Did I stalk her? No, but I found out which way she went, and I went around the other way. And I accidentally, on purposely, bumped into her. So, well, hello there, how are you? You're talking to me. Well, that's what it's called. I say, you doing okay? I'm praying for you. How's your, how's your husband? How's your family and everything? She said, why are you being nice to me? I said, well, because I'm supposed to. Well, aren't you mad at me? I said, I got beyond that a long time ago. I'm more worried about you guys. Jesus goes after the one, not the 99, but the one that's on the outside. Don't you understand where you come from? I said, honestly, I don't. But that's you. That's, you have the right to feel that way. But the church goes on. And as a, as a, I'm telling you, as a pastor, I would hate to stand before the Lord, say, I didn't go to church because people that I don't understand, we're going to the same church that I was going to. When it's not our church, it's the Lord's church. I said, we want you to come back. She said, will you preach at us? I said, I don't preach at anybody. I'm, God may just give me something to say. It might be in the message. I don't know what God's going to give me every time I stand before that pulpit. In fact, I listen to some of those things, and I don't like listening to my, my sir, myself preach. But I've listened to some of the things, and, where did that come from? Because I look at my notes. That was in my notes. It had to be the Lord. I said, I just want to tell you, as the pastor, the last church that you attended faithfully to, you're more than welcome to come. We're going to love you. We're going to care about you. And we're going to put this stuff behind us. And we need to move forward because the cause of Christ is that important. So, well, okay. And then she said, I got to go shopping. I said, so do I. Have a great day. I finally got that off my chest because I've been waiting for the right time. I'll tell you, when I got out of that, I felt a whole lot better. It's because you know what the devil does? The devil says, that church don't like you anymore. I bet that church, if they saw you, they would just be nasty to you and hateful to you and criticize you. And, and they, they wouldn't want you to come back. And if you ever came back, they would make a big deal about you come back to church. That's the devil's lies. I've had people tell me this. It's real. The devil doesn't play games. That's why the calling of God are without repentance. It doesn't change based upon circumstances. The lady from the cancer to call me today. She said, I just want to know how you're doing. I said, well, I'm doing okay. I said, I've heard from you for a while. She said, um, well, what are you doing to be able to, to heal? I'm serving the Lord. I'm talking to people who are, are hurting. 
She said, how can you tell people how to help them when you're hurting yourself? I said, that's the great thing about how the Lord works. Through our, our, our healing comes by focusing on other people, not on ourselves. Hmm, that's a unique concept. Yeah, it is unique. That's the way our Lord works. That's the calling of God. And the great thing about it is we look at Moses, is that Moses was not a perfect person, was he? Far from perfect. And he had his times. He wasn't called the friend of God the first 40 years. He was with, with Potiphar. And he wasn't called the friend of God in the time of gathering the Jews together. It wasn't until the last 40 years when he focused on doing exactly what God wanted him to do. It's a process. God put away those 80 years of, of the formative spiritual years of Moses, and now he basically lifted him up and said, hey, we've gone through a lot, buddy, but you still love me and I love you, and I'm not going to change. That's the calling of God upon our lives. Whether we feel like we deserve it or not, it's not even the issue. Do you feel like we're adequate or not? That's not even the issue. Do you feel like we're successful or not? That's not even the issue because the word success is so subjective. For some folks, suggest to be, um, to be, to be able to be successful, you have to have a whole lot of production and a lot of things to be seen to be successful. When you think about that widow woman and making sure, and, and Elijah came, feed me first. Success is that lady being able to feed her child for a long time. Or when the widow woman came to Elisha and said, uh, the creditors are coming, and he says, go get, get as many buck, as many containers you can and fill that thing up. The success is that they did, she did exactly, the kids exactly was done and that the bills were paid, she didn't lose her kids to the creditors, and she could live in a peaceful home. That's success. Everybody's definition of success is different. Why? Because he made us differently. And so you can't minimize or major on the flaws of our lives or our faults of our lives or, or the things we've done wrong in our lives God doesn't hold the mirror up. He says, I still love you because you are mine. You are a work in progress. Remember we talked about going to the fair and we go to the, the hall of mirrors, you know, the distortion. That's ex Satan is a great distorter. God is truth. When you hear what God has to say, you know exactly what he is saying. You don't have to say, um... Can you give me another version of that? Truth is truth. And that's the great thing about us Christians. We have the truth living in our lives. We have the truth in our hands. We have the truth because he established a body of believers to grow. And when you and I, if we were to put ourselves like when we were kids, I mean, whenever we're in a stable place, is that mom went out on our birthdays, she would say, stand against the wall. Let me mark to see how tall you are. And then another six months, let's see how tall you are. And if we made it to the next birthday, let's see how tall you are. If we were to look at ourselves, we first started coming to church compared to now, would we see a distinct difference? Absolutely. Why? Because you start off as babies. Now we're hopefully adults. And it's more than just the stature, the physical stature, but it's the spiritual stature. Is that how God can take people who don't want to talk to anybody and making them preachers and putting them in positions to where they're talking to a whole lot of people that he doesn't know. I mean, that's not about a work of God. When you look at your life and you look at, okay, my life has meaning. My life has purpose. I may not see it, but God does. So if God does, then God, show me what I need to do today to establish that purpose in my life so I can see it. Because we are visual people, aren't we? And so if we have to see it, why don't we ask God? God, open up our eyes. Did not Elisha tell uh, the servant in Dothan? When the servant said, uh, Master, we got a problem. 
<clears throat> the, the enemy, they're all over the place. We're surrounded. We're finished. And he says, God opened up his eyes. And God, God shows the servant that there's chariots of fire surrounding them, but also not just surrounding them, but all around the, 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 the town. God, show us. Give us that, that, that little peak of understanding that I mean that much to you. When you think about the little children that Jesus resurrected from the dead, they were important to Jesus enough to stop the, the funeral processions and raise them from the dead. Uh, Lazarus is important that he would wait several days and then go out there, sit this way, not just for Lazarus because he went because Lazarus had died, but it was that important that Jesus came to say, okay, Lazarus, come on, get out of, the, get out of there, take off the grave clothes and start living like you're supposed to live. Story after story after story. Old Testament and New Testament. And it doesn't matter when we, we falter or fail. Look at the book of Song of Solomon. We don't I'll never go there. I'm going to show you a verse. That was a synonized marriage verse. Song of Solomon. Where is that thing at? It was before, before Isaiah. Verse 7, Song of Solomon 8, 7. This is our marriage verse. When we started dating, we started establishing verses regarding our lives. And we prayed for a verse that God would give to us through our daily Bible reading together that would, that would picture our life. 36 years of ups and downs and all kinds of crazy things. It says this, many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be condemned. It doesn't matter what comes our way because who is the, the center of our life? The God of love. We have the agape love given to us through the one that died for us. That's part of his calling upon our lives. And it doesn't matter. Many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. Look at Isaiah chapter 43, I think it is. Isaiah 43. Yes. Look at verses 1 and following. Isaiah 43, verses 1 and following. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Can we claim that verse for us believers right now? Yes. For he says, I have redeemed thee. Are you redeemed? Okay. So we don't have to fear. Don't have to worry about that. He says, I've called thee by thy name. He says, he knows us, doesn't he? He knows us by name. He has our names imprinted into his hand. And says this, he says, thou art mine. Do we belong to the Lord? Yes. So, yes, in the initial um, interpretation, it's going to the nation of Israel. But in the many applications, this can also be applied to us. Verse 2 says this. Remember that we can claim no reason to fear that we are, we are part of God. It says this, when thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee. He will not stop problems to come our way. He's just going to be in the waters with us. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Why? For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Is he our Savior? Yes. So yes, initial interpretation, he is speaking through the prophet Isaiah to the nation of Israel, but the application can be this. God saved us. He's redeemed us. He's, he walks with us. He protects us. And he, even though we go through, have problems, he's not going to desert us. He says, I gave Egypt for thy ransom, 
Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Now look at the first part of verse 4. Since thou wast precious in my sight. Do you have any type of jewelry or pictures or things that's precious to you? And that no matter what happens, you're gonna, nothing's going to happen to those things. Because they have such emotional attachment to that. He says, you are precious to me. Does that mean he knows our faults? Yeah. He knows when we fail. He knows when we sin. He knows when we make a mess of things. But you don't see that in here, do you? No, because he says... You're precious. It says, Thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore I would give men for thee and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. Look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Look at verse 33. John 16, 33. These things, because he is the prince of peace. But he says this. Now notice there's a period after that. So that's a sentence. Next, next thought is this. In the world, ye shall have tribulation. And you got a colon right there. In the world, you're going to have tribulation. If you go back to what he said before, he says, you're still going to have peace because you're in me. Now he says, after the call, he says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I've overcome the world. First he starts out, you're going to have peace because you're in me. Now because you have peace with me, just want to let you know that the world's going to be full of problems. Have you had any problems this week? All of us, I'm sure, could say, oh, boy, Lord, uh, this has been one of them weeks. Can we just fast forward and maybe have another, a better week next week? We can all say those throughout several different weeks. But God doesn't cause us or protect us from the problems. He's in the middle of the problems with us. That's part of the calling without repentance because he says fear not we read in isaiah chapter 43 we read two times he says don't fear don't fear why do he say don't fear because the problems are coming the water is going to come and it's going to rise up and you're going to feel like you're about ready to drown but you're not going to think about peter when he's walking on the water everything was great as he locked on the Lord, as he's looking on the lord but then when he started looking at all the, the lightning flashing and listen, uh, and the, the thunder rolling and everything like that, he got his eyes off the Lord. He sank. And he prayed one of the most spiritual prayers ever, and it was like two words. Lord, help. And what did the Lord do? When he, the Lord knew he was going to do it, too. That's the crazy thing. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Don't fear. I know what you're going to do. I'm not going to let you drown. I'm going to pick your hand up. I'm going to put you back in the boat. And you don't have to fear because I'm in the boat with you. Problems are going to come. And you're going to get overwhelmed sometimes. But in me, you're going to have peace. Why? Because he is the author of peace. You can't have peace without Jesus. Why? Because he is our advocate. He is the one that speaks and has satisfied God by dying and shedding his blood on the cross. You're going to have problems. Just expect it, but it's going to be okay because you're not going to go through it by yourself. Did not we, we look at Hebrews chapter 13 last week? He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that you can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. In the midst of all the problems, we can boldly say, yes, it's horrible. And I may have said some things I shouldn't have said. I may have acted as irrational as irrational can get. But you know what? The Lord says, it's going to be okay 
because I'm going to help you. And you're not going to get through this thing by yourself. That's part of our calling. That'd be kind of like a perk of being a Christian. The calling of God, yes, it's, it's strong and it's tough sometimes, but God doesn't leave us to do it by ourselves. We do it with him together. Why? Because he knows what we're supposed to do. We don't. So just keep on keeping on. And whatever happens, let God take care of the rest. Because ultimately, it's up to him to do the production of all the events, not us. Paul says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It's God's job to take care of the production. It's just our job to plant and water. That's all we're supposed to do. And there's people out there that we can minister to, that we can pray for, that just need to know that someone cares about them. Because the old devil's been lying in their ear. And so the only way to do that is just show them the grace and love of Jesus Christ. He will. He'll work it out. It may take time. But as he's working things out, just be faithful. Just be available. You may have to be a little honorary sometimes too, but that's okay. But it's going to be okay because the Lord is in control. We serve a good God, don't we? Okay. Let's take up some prayer requests. Okay. Who would go for? Okay, Gina, go ahead. Let's go. Go ahead, Gina. those needles in his back. He's tough. Okay, Ayla. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Still thinking when my wife took our MS and our visit to physician was really not as proven. Sure. Okay. Things got me bad with that. Okay, we'll definitely pray about that. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Good try. My sister called me this week and her husband Larry, he's had cancer on his face and they sent her from Jura. And now he's got it on his foot. And the doctor told him if you get it once on you, that it will kill you. If you have it anywhere else, sure. Skin wise. And uh, they told me to keep them in prayer. Sure. And then the wounds are bad there. Mm -hmm. And my other one told me she's out here getting her crystal knowledge. And then another, Sue Johnson. We see this stuff happen to both of them. But I said, my Lord, but we love them. Okay. All right. Okay, Holly. Oh, thank you for praying for me for when I was sick and then when I was in California. Mm -hmm. um, my mom's not doing good. And um, I just, there, she's got a nurse and then she's also got a hair or a, what is it? Social worker. Social worker. And um, anyway, um, this, I just want her to get into a nursing home. Sure. We'll pray that the Lord works all that out. Okay. Uh, pray for the services on Sunday. Um, pray for your missionaries. A lot of stuff going around the world. They definitely need your prayers. Uh, Israel. Um, yes, ma'am. Okay. Unspoken. 
sure. Well, no, we'll definitely. Every every problem is important to the Lord, and so we'll definitely pray about that. We're going to pray for your missionaries here, here and across the water. God, work those things out. Pray for the church. Pray for this Christmas shoe boxes. Uh, we're making progress. Thank God for that. And um, whatever we have, that, that wherever they go, even if we had one, if we got to the right person, that's all that matters to me. And so we're just going to keep doing what we're doing. And then uh, pray that that happens in a, in, in a month. Um, is on the second Sunday of November is when we send the shoe boxes out. And so we'll be praying that God would send these boxes to the right place and then to the right people. And um, that God will work a, work a miracle through these shoe boxes. And he will. He does. And I, I can't wait. You may not hear a lot of stories now. When we get to heaven, I'm sure we'll have a lot of great stories about, about what a shoe box from Pittsburgh, Kansas, from our church did to encourage someone or save someone or a church being established. And so all around the world. All around the world. So uh, definitely just there's no work of God that's not important. And so don't ever minimize anything that you do because as the old song says, little is much when God is in it. Okay? All right, there's no other prayer requests. Well, yes, ma'am. <clears throat> don't know. It's up to what Franklin Graham can do in their organization to what they can do. Don't know. It's it's the, up to the Lord's leading on those things. Okay? It's another prayer request. Let's take our... Yes, sir, Logan. Okay, we'll definitely do that. Yes, ma'am. Sure, we'll definitely do that. No one's promised long life. We're just guaranteed right now, nothing else. So take, make the most of it. Invest your lives, okay? There's no other prayer request. Let's go to the Lord, casting our cares upon him, for he cares for us. Let's pray. Lord, we love you tonight. We're so thankful, Lord, that you love us so much. Even when we're unlovable, you still love us. You love us even though we don't. We sometimes don't trust you like we should. You love us. You love us even though, Lord, that we don't. We have low, low belief in ourselves or anything. You still love us. And so, Father, we know that there's an everlasting love that you love us with, and we're thankful, Lord, that uh, you care about us so much. And so, Father, I pray that you would be with each one in all the prayer requests, Lord. 
There's an awful lot of folks that are hurting and just need a supernatural touch. And Lord, just need to, uh, just to people know that you're a great God. And so, Father, I pray you administer through each situation that's been presented. Lord, whether it be uh, a physical touch, Lord, a healing touch, or guidance to direct your comfort, whatever it is, Lord, may your will be done in their lives. And Father, I pray you be at this church. And Lord, bring people out to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, be with our missionaries. Take care of them tonight. Keep them safe. Lord, as they put their head on their pillows, just let them know that we're thinking about them and we're praying for them. Bless their ministry and thank you that we're a part of many great places, great many ministries around the world. And Father, it be a great day when we get to heaven to see that we partnered with such wonderful servants of you. Father, now bless the services on Sunday. Help us, Lord, to teach and preach as you want us to preach. May your will be done. Be glorified in all that's said and done. Keep us safe, Lord, until you come back. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Good night, Lord Willow. We'll see you on Sunday unless the Lord comes back.